Should a new ham buy an antenna tuner or an antenna analyzer first? Lead acid versus lithium iron phosphate. And can we do APRS on GMRS frequencies with the VGC radio? Coming up this time on Mailbag Monday. What's happening, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to Ham Radio Tube. My name is Mike K at MRD. If you have amateur radio related questions for me, shoot me an email k8mrd at icloud.com and you just may have a question featured on one of these episodes known as Mailbag Monday. Let's dive right in. We got a new ham here. He says, hey Mike, I am pretty new to ham radio. I just said that. (laughs) Got my technician license in January and upgraded to general in February. Congratulations. Welcome to the hobby. That's awesome. I've been diving in head first and have a couple of questions for you if you've got a minute to check them out. I do. I recently swung by RNL to pick up my first HF rig, a Yesu FT891. Nice. RNL is where I bought my first 891. The folks there were awesome, and we ended up chatting about antennas and tuners. I mentioned I was leaning towards something like an X10 or a Pac10 to pair it with, but they suggest I might want to grab a tuner too. Thing is, I've seen a bunch of YouTubers, and I think you've said this too, uh, mentioned that a resident antenna doesn't really need a tuner. No, it does not. So now I'm torn. Here's my main question. After getting the antenna, should my next buy be a tuner? No. Or should I just skip it for now and run without one? Yes. And if not a tuner, would an antenna analyzer be a smarter investment to start? 100% yes. Down the road, once I've saved up a bit, I'm eyeing a whip system. Something like the Wolf River Coil sounds cool. It is. Any recommendations for a setup like that in the $200 range? Thanks so much for all you do, Mike. Your videos have been a lifesaver as I figure this hobby out. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks for writing it. So let's talk about tuners. All a tuner is going to do is match the impedance uh, to from the radio to the antenna and make your radio think it's looking into a 50 ohm load. Uh, they're great. I have them. I have one sitting here in the shack that I literally never use because I have a resonant antenna that's resonant on all the bands. Um, I do use the tuner a little bit on like 30 meters, 17 meters, 12 meters just to sweeten it up. They're, they're a little high, like two-ish, um, but that's about it. So no, I do not think you should buy a tuner first. An antenna analyzer, however, like this Rig Expert Stick Pro, by far the most valuable tool I would say anyone, any ham will have in their arsenal. A tuner is going to make your radio think it's seeing a 50 ohm load, but an analyzer is going to actually show you what your antenna is doing. Impedance, where it's resonant. You can, like with this one, if there's a fault in your coax, you can find that. They're such incredibly useful tools. Um, my first analyzer was an MFJ. Then I got the rig expert, and this is, I mean, it's got a rechargeable 18650 in it. So in terms of tuners, like, yeah, if you have a 40 meter NFED half wave, you're going to be resident on 40, 20, 15, and 10, because those higher frequencies are just harmonics of 7 megahertz. So if you want to get on, say, 17 meters, 17 meters isn't really resonant on a 40 meter NFED half wave, and the 891 has no tuner whatsoever, so you'd be looking at a pretty high impedance there. So a tuner would sweeten that up. Or you can do what I do and make your antennas linked NFEDs. So if you watch the video, I've done a bunch of videos on this. The, the, the best video to watch for how I do it, I made a video called like the Pac-10 with the K8MRD mod or something like that. I'll put links in the description. But most recently, I reviewed an antenna called the Dually 2.0. And when I made that antenna, I made links for every single band, 40, 30, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 so I can be resonant, but just unplugging a little banana plug, and now that changes the physical length of the wire, so it is resonant, and I don't use a tuner. So that's what I would do, Get it, whether it's the x or the pac get a linked end fed half wave, and your life will be awesome. Now, as far as the Wolf River Coils thing, pretty much any Wolf River Coils antenna you buy is going to be under $200 with the exception of the Silver Bullet Platinum. I think just the coil alone is $175. There's all kinds of different configurations for Wolf River Coils. If you don't care about 80, look at the Wolf River Coil Mini 
or the Wolf of Recoil Sporty 40 with the their 213 inch whip. And I like the Mega Tripod. It's just a, a bigger tripod. So it's got a wider base, less tendency to blow over in the wind. The Wolf of Recoil Silver Bullet 1000 was the absolute first antenna I ever purchased for a reason. They're fantastic antennas. So um, it really depends on do you want 80 or not and how long of a whip, how big of a footprint you're trying to make in terms of height. Um, but like the Sporty 40 with the 213 inch whip is a great combination. They have one that's called like the Soda Special or something like that, where it's the, the shorter 40 meter coil and a shorter whip. They all work great. I love them. I got nothing but good things to say about Wolf of Recoils. So yeah, pretty much any way you go, you're, you're going to be under $200 ish, unless you do like the 213 inch whip and the Wolf of Recoils Silver Bullet Platinum which will do higher power on digital modes like FT8. You can do 100 watts on FT8. Um, yeah, that's my advice. Get get whichever combination you uh, feel like. I've made plenty of videos about Wolf River Coils, though, so, and there's no shortage of them on the internet. So, uh, yeah, I highly recommend Wolf River Coils. So hopefully that answers your question. Get an analyzer. You don't need a tuner. Next, we got someone who just came back into ham radio. He says, Mike, in December 24, I got back into the hobby after a 17-year hiatus. Well, welcome back to you. I've subscribed to your YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Poto was not around back when I was active. No, it was not. But seems a big, a big deal now. I've done a little hunting, but no activating yet. There's a park very near me that I will likely activate once the weather gets a little warmer. I read a lot about LifePo 4 batteries, and I get they are light and work well, but they are certainly pricey. They don't have to be. Uh, I can remember field days from way back where we, use, uh, we were using deep cycle sealed lead acid batteries. Being an owner of an older RV, I do have experience with those. I could easily borrow an SLA from a camper. I guess I could just take my whole RV, but that has pros and cons. It would cost you more to bring that RV out in gas than it probably would to buy a lithium iron phosphate battery. I'm sure I'll eventually acquire a LifePo 4 battery, but in the meantime, I've spent quite a bit on radios and antennas getting back into this. So long as I'm able to deal with the weight, is there any reason I could not activate using an older technology lead acid battery? It seems no one does that, or at least they don't make YouTube videos about doing it anymore. So yes, you absolutely 100% can activate with a lead acid battery. The reason you don't see any of us using them is because they're freaking heavy. They're heavy as all get. It's literally lead. <laughs> You're like, what's the heaviest thing I could carry? Lead, done. Uh, so yeah, they can be had for pretty cheap, and the deep cycle one, you'll you'll get uh, the capacity out of it. Uh, but I want to show you, like, you don't have to spend a lot of money to get a lithium iron phosphate battery. So for just a casual POTA activation, this 12 amp hour battery from BioNO is 124 bucks. Shameless plug, you can save 10% off BioNO products with code HRT. It's not an affiliate link. I don't get any commissions for it. It's just a deal I worked out with Kevin to save you money. So you can take 12 bucks off of that and uh, 112 you know, dollars roughly for a 12 amp hour battery that will do you uh, fantastic for any POTA activation you're gonna do. Now, you can also just get some of these Chinese ones, like here's Amazon. Here's a 20 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery from EcoWorthy, and I'm just picking one at random. I've never used this, so I can't recommend it, but I've heard good things about EcoWorthy. 65 bucks for a 20 amp hour battery. Now you are gonna need a lithium iron phosphate charger to go with either of these batteries, uh, but you know, like a, like a four or a six amp charger would be plenty fine for any of these. So you don't have to spend a lot of money for a lithium iron phosphate battery. But if you feel like lugging out uh, a lead acid battery, a lead acid battery was my first battery that I ever started using. I bought an eight amp hour Duracell AGM battery. Now, because it wasn't a deep cycle, you really only get like half the capacity out of it. But that's what I used for my first out. This is before Poda even existed. I would just go to the city park down the street from me and just turn on my 891 and run QRP with it. And Bob's your uncle. So, yeah, 100% you can. But lithium iron phosphate batteries have come down so much in price. Uh, they're, they're, they're very affordable for everyone. I mentioned BioNO specifically because those are actually the batteries that I generally use when I'm playing radio, um, they just increased their warranty to 20 years. So they're an American company, they're, they're in California. They've got a 20 year warranty on them. They've got batteries that have been out longer than 10 years and they have like 87% capacity still left in them, which is amazing. So you're getting 
very, very good sells and you're getting a quality made product. Whereas with the Chinese stuff, eh, you're going to spend half that much. Are you going to have a warranty? Maybe. They advertise maybe five, 10 year warranty. Are they going to be around if there's any problems, customer service? Who knows? With Bioeno, buy once, cry once. Uh, ask anyone you know about Bioeno, and I promise you they will give you nothing but rave reviews for their customer service and the quality of their batteries. So that's what I got to say about that. But welcome back to Amateur Radio, and I hope to catch you on the air doing an activation one day. Lastly, we got a question about APRS with the VGC radio and GMRS. Ha! This is fun. This viewer writes, I am going to ask a question that a subset of the amateur radio community, specifically the sad hams, may frown upon. Well, that's right up my alley. I watched your recent video on the Vero VGC VRN76 and my spidey senses went off. I have an annual hunt in California. They let you do that in California? For blacktail and uh, I and one other in the group are hams, but we solo hunt a lot. I'm trying to get the others to man up and get licensed. Well, shaming their manhood would be a good way to start. <laughs> I've never had any use for APRS, uh, but this case has me intrigued with a caveat. Even if just for the radio to radio beaconing, can it be done, say, cover your ears, sad hams, 462.700? No network, no repeater, unless it's a portable one I set up. No linking, I see you FCCs. Uh, GMRS is a gateway drug to ham and other guys, and the other guys with GMRS may see the incredible versatility of getting their ticket. And we get position data until then, yes. Side note, the web says downloadable maps antenna up. I have no idea what you mean there, but yes, there are downloadable maps. Very little cell coverage up there, so if we could just get general position data to our cells via the radio's Bluetooth uplink, wow. Thanks for making APRS interesting for once, lol. Well, it certainly was not my intention to make APRS interesting, but since this goes against everything that ham radio stands for, I'm going to answer your question. Short answer, yes, you can. Let's see how to make this work. Now, before we get into this, uh, technically, APRS on GMRS is legal, but per the FCCs, uh, it can only be done on a radio that has a fixed antenna, where this radio has a detachable antenna. So, technically, this is against the rules. And for the record, I'm going to say, do not do this. It is illegal. So all of this is going to be hypothetical, but check this out. So here is the HT app and I have my radio connected here. And if we go to APRS and we click this little gear here, we can see here's our call sign. So that had me intrigued. What, how do we get over this call sign thing? Because you're on GMRS. Well, I started experimenting because with this particular radio, you need a passcode. So I said to myself, could we bypass that somehow or just come up with something? So I just put in Bob. Maybe you want to use your name. You can use your GMRS uh, license for this, though, it finds out. And it turns out Bob's passcode is 29613. And if we look at this clip here, you can see that Bob was transmitting on the GMRS frequency for whatever it was, 462700. And it was transmitting Bob. And here we can see these are some of the packets that I sent. And if we just click on one of those locations, well, by George, that's where I was transmitting. Now there are downloadable maps. So if we hit this I right here, we go to offline maps. Uh, some of these are gonna be bigger files than the other. I found the terrain open topo map is gonna have the smallest file and be able to give you the largest footprint on the map. So if we hit this plus, uh, it might take a second to populate here. There we are. We can zoom out to however big you want within a bit of a degree there. So basically that blue dot is where I am. And at the bottom of this square, that's like 40 miles. So we basically got maybe a, maybe a 50 by 50 mile uh, coverage here. But you can zoom in now. Notice down here, it might you know, might not be able to see it, but 2.26 gigs is how big this file will be when I download it. So it will take some time. But if if you just zoom in kind of to where your area is, so like here's the whole city of Huntsville, 
89 megabytes. So you can save that and you will be able to do offline mapping with this. So how does this work? The first thing we need to do is go into our channel list and I've already made a GMRS APRS frequency. Look at that and I named it GMRS APRS with the receive and transmit frequency 462700. Save that and we can go back into APRS here, go into our settings and what if I just change my call sign to WRQD567 which is my GMRS call sign and hit save. Then we go to this N5DUX APRS password generator and type WRQD567 and hit generate passcode. Would you believe that gives me a passcode that I can then enter in here and hit save. And if we open our radio settings and go to APRS settings, you can see there is WRQD56. It does a dash seven, so it doesn't take the whole uh, call sign there. Do we care? Maybe, maybe not. You can put your name. I mean, it's technically not legal what we're doing anyway, so whatever. So there you go. Yes, we can do APRS over GMRS with the VGC VRN76, or presumably the other variants of this radio. And again, do keep in mind, I am not recommending you do this. I am recommending you do not do this. I am not a lawyer. I am not giving legal advice, uh, <laughs> but I'm a ham and I like experimenting. So, uh, yep, you sure can. <laughs> So that's all we got today, guys. My name is Mike K at MRD. If you have amateur radio related questions for me, shoot me an email. I would love to hear from you. K8MRD at iCloud.com. We will see you again on another episode of Ham Radio Tube 73, y'all.